Welcome. In this video, we're going to look at the broad topic of energy in space, and we're going to start out <clears throat> with gravitational potential energy. Um, just like we saw with the force of gravity, uh, there's an easy way to calculate force of gravity, mg, and a hard way, uh, Newton's law of universal gravitation. Um, mg works great when you know what little g is. So just like uh, gravitational potential energy, which has the easy way, mgh, which works great when you know what little g is, uh, we have to have a more robust way of calculating gravitational potential energy when we don't know what the value of little g is. All right, so we're going to start with the relationship that uh, potential energy is equal to the opposite of the integral of the force with respect to position. All right, so specifically here, we're going to talk about gravitational potential energy. So that means we need the force of gravity. And we are going to use that more robust version of Newton's law of universal gravitation for the force of gravity here. So the gravitational potential energy is going to be the negative integral of big G, big M, little m, all over R squared. And I'm going to change my position variable from a dx to a dr. So we're going to integrate this with respect to r. Uh, so rewriting this in a form that I can use the power rule for integration, we have negative integral big G, big M, little m, r to the negative 2 dr. So remember that your exponent goes up by 1. That's going to give us r to the negative 1. And we have to divide by the new exponent. So we get then negative out front. The big G, the M's are both constants. They come out front as well. And then we're going to have an R to the negative 1. And we need to multiply, uh, sorry, divide by the new exponent, which is negative 1, which is going to take care of that negative. And we're going to get a plus C inside because it was an indefinite integral. All right. So here's our gravitational potential energy function. We need to take care of that constant of integration. And I am going to define my zero place for gravitational potential energy uh, to be when these two masses are infinitely far apart. Uh, because when they're infinitely far apart, there's no force of gravity between them, so we wouldn't expect any gravitational potential energy out there. So using that initial condition, I've got zero joules for my gravitational potential. That's equal to big G M M over infinity, because R is equal to infinity at this place, and plus c. So a finite term divided by infinity is zero. We get zero for our c, so we have our gravitational potential energy uh, function as this. Ug is equal to big G mm over r. And remember again that r is the distance between the centers of mass. Uh, so we could find the gravitational potential energy for something on the surface of Earth. That r then would be the radius of the Earth. Uh, big M would be the mass of the Earth, little m would be the mass of the object. Um, <clears throat> now, this satisfies the fact that I want gravitational potential energy to be zero at uh, an infinite distance away, but it does not satisfy uh, the way that gravitational potential energy behaves on the surface of Earth. So on the surface of Earth, we know that when we raise an object higher above the surface of Earth, the gravitational potential energy increases. I need this function to behave the same way, because right now, this function looks like this. This would be gravitational potential energy on the vertical axis and R on the horizontal axis, and this function looks like that. It does go to zero at infinity, but as R increases, like let's say first we have an R1 right here, uh, and then we have an R2 right here, as R increases, the gravitational potential energy actually decreases. So this would not behave, this equation wouldn't work at the surface of Earth as written. So we fix that, and I'm doing a little hand waving here, by slapping on a negative. When we slap on that negative now, this reflects into the, uh, around the x-axis, and we get that function. Uh, and then now, it goes to zero when R is infinite, and if we have some certain R1 right here, giving us a potential energy, UG1, then we go to some distance farther away, which is going to be R2, then that's going to give us a potential energy that is less negative than R1, which is greater. Okay, Less negative is greater. So the end result is all of these gravitational potential energies for objects in space are going to be negative. 
Uh, so don't freak out about that. Um, it's just going to be negative, and the reason we want it to be negative is so that as things get farther away from an object like the Earth, their gravitational potential energy increases, which is what we need the gravitational potential energy to do. We want it to function the same way out in space as it would here on Earth. All right? So now the reason that we need this gravitational potential energy equation uh, is so that we can use conservation of energy in space. So let's take a look at what that might look like. Um, so so let's take an example. Uh, here's the Earth, um, and here is the Earth-killing asteroid that's on its way to Earth. And so we discover this asteroid and we make a calculation. It's traveling at some V initial as it's traveling towards Earth. It's got some initial distance away from the Earth. Let's call that R1. Um, and we want to make, we want to calculate how fast this thing's going to be going uh, when it slams into the Earth. So how fast, let's call it V final. Uh, we should call it V terminal because we're all going to die. Uh, so V final is going to be bigger. How do I know V final is going to be bigger? Because the gravitational potential energy is decreasing. And that means the kinetic energy has to be increasing as this thing travels towards the Earth. Uh, how do I know that energy is conserved here? Because just gravity is acting between the Earth and this asteroid. And if gravity is the only force acting, it's conservative. Energy is conserved. So we have an initial gravitational potential energy out here. That's going to be given by the equation that we just derived. And it's also got an initial kinetic energy. And so as it travels to Earth, like I said, the gravitational potential energy decreases, which means the kinetic energy has to increase. And so energy is conserved, we set those equal to each other. Important to note, the gravitational potential energy when this asteroid slams into the Earth is not going to be zero. Remember we defined gravitational potential energy to be zero when the asteroid is infinitely far away from the Earth. So it is going to have a gravitational potential energy and the R uh, in the UG final is going to be the radius of the Earth. Um, again, that's how far away it's going to be that instant it slams in, our Earth. Okay, so you would set those two energies, those two amounts of energy equal to each other and solve for V final in the K final equation. All right, so energy is conserved for these astronomical objects just like it would be uh, on the surface of Earth if just gravity is acting on them. So now we're prepared to talk about energy in circular orbits. So here I've got uh, a planet, let's say, and there's a moon orbiting around it um, at an orbital radius. Let's call that R sub zero. And it's orbiting with orbital velocity V sub zero. Uh, and so let's take a look at what its total energy in orbit is going to be here. Uh, understanding that it's going to have gravitational potential energy and it's going to have kinetic energy out there. So its gravitational potential is going to be negative, big G, two m's divided by r. And its kinetic energy is going to be one half m times the velocity of the orbit squared. So here's the total energy in orbit. Now, something interesting happens when we put in the velocity uh, that we derived in an earlier video for a circular orbit. So that velocity for a circular orbit is square root of g uh, over, G, sorry, G big M over R squared. So V in orbit is square root big G times big M over R, not R squared, but R. Okay, so we're going to plug that in. Um, we're squaring the square root, so that's going to get rid of it. So we have a negative big G, big M little m over the radius of the orbit plus half of little m times big G, big M over R. Uh, and that's R orbit. The big M again is the mass of the planet, the little m is the mass of the moon, and so basically we got negative one something plus half of that same thing, because we get half of big G mm over R, uh, R orbit. Um, so subtracting those, we end up with negative half of big G big M little m over radius of the orbit 
which ends up with the surprising result that the total energy for something in a perfectly circular orbit is equal to half of whatever its gravitational potential is right there. That's worth putting into the memory banks. Okay, so again, the total energy in orbit is half of whatever the gravitational potential is. Don't forget the negative sign. The negative sign is in there. Uh, all right. Lastly, in this video, we're in a place we can talk about something called the escape velocity. Uh, so I've got something on Earth that I want to uh, get rid of, uh, and I want to get rid of it in a really bad way. I want to get rid of it so that it never comes back. So essentially, I want to kick this thing and give it so much velocity that it never comes back to Earth. So for example, the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecrafts are now uh, in interstellar space and we gave them an escape velocity, actually not just to escape the Earth, but to escape the sun's gravitational pull as well. So how are we gonna do this? We're gonna use energy conservation. Let's ignore for the time being that the Earth is rotating, uh, and then this thing, when it's at rest on the surface of Earth, is only gonna have a gravitational potential energy. So we're using conservation of energy here. So we're gonna say E initial equals E final, right? And let's think for a second what E final is going to be if we give this thing enough kinetic energy to get infinitely far away from the Earth. So if it's infinitely far from the Earth, it's going to have no gravitational potential. And that minimum amount of kinetic energy that we give it when we kick it off of Earth uh, is going to get, make it so that, and this is interesting, the object has no velocity when it's infinitely far from Earth. Okay? So think about that. No velocity when it's infinitely far from Earth whatever. This is the minimum amount of velocity we would need to give it. So, on the surface of Earth, it's only got gravitational potential energy. When it's infinitely far away from the Earth, it's going to have no gravitational potential, and we're going to assume that it comes to rest when it gets all the way out there. So, the gravitational potential energy initially has to equal zero because it's got no gravitational final and it has no kinetic final. Oh, but wait a minute, it doesn't just have gravitational potential because I'm going to kick it. So the kinetic plus the potential, when it's on the surface of Earth, it has to equal zero. That's the key thing for escape velocity. Anytime you're calculating escape velocity, uh, you set the kinetic plus the gravitational equal to zero. The kinetic is going to be the energy I give it. Uh, the gravitational is just what it has. So we have one half the mass times the velocity squared. This is going to be our escape velocity, plus uh, ug initial, so that's negative, big G, 2ms over r, this is going to be the radius of the Earth in this particular case, and that's going to equal zero. Um, so at the very minimum, our kinetic energy, as we can see here, has to equal our gravitational potential energy. And so big G, m over r. And so the mass of the object cancels out. It doesn't matter. Solving for the escape velocity, we get 2 times big G mass of the Earth over the radius of the Earth, and we're taking the square root. So the escape velocity, we could calculate with big G, the mass of the Earth, and the radius of the Earth. All right, so the key understanding here is that the escape velocity happens, the minimum escape velocity, is when the kinetic energy we give it is equal to the gravitational potential that it has. All right, um, We could do this for something in orbit as well. Uh, when something is in orbit, it's got both kinetic and gravitational potential. We're going to have to add on an additional amount of kinetic energy to make it the total energy equal to zero. All right, So that is the key. When you're finding escape velocity, total energy equals zero and solve for that escape velocity, all right? I'd say it's probably not worth memorizing this. Um, it's worth understanding that the total energy when making that calculation has to equal zero, all right? So that's it for this time. Thanks.